Okay, we are live with Mark Lafleur. Am I saying the last name the way you like it said? You know what? The only thing that kills me is people who are like Lafleur. Lafleur. It's like, it's like uh, Lafleur. That movie they try, Do- Dodgeball. They try, to, they try to add the the, the French accent when they, when they can't. Yeah, and they yeah. fail. It's yeah. like a Dodgeball. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you ever watch that with? Yeah, exactly. It's like okay, Lafleur. <laughs> it always I think kills sometimes me. Sometimes I unintentionally try to say things in French. You do. You definitely. <laughs> but do. I do exactly what Mark said. That's why I'm glad I didn't mess this up. But Mark, you've been through a lot since you were here last time. And I, I kind of want to get that update. Uh, and then I'm going to ask uh, uh, about the book. But I, I, first of all, I didn't know you grew up outside Ottawa in my brain. Did you go to Western? No, I well, went to University of Waterloo. Waterloo. So yeah, which either way was like, might as well have been the other side of the planet when you grow up in Cornwall. Um, so yeah, Ottawa, there's Ottawa. And then an hour outside of Ottawa, you've got the small town Cornwall. It's on the 401. So if you're driving through to Montreal, I'll guarantee you're you know, driving straight through it. Um, so I grew up there. And um, when it came time to go to university, I actually didn't even bother trying with Queens, Ottawa or McGill or any of those because they were too close. I was like, no, nah, I got to I got to spread my wings. I got to go see what's going on in the rest of the world. Like Toronto was considered this like different planet. So for me to go anything on the other side of Toronto was okay. That's, you know, new adventure to take You're on. stretching the boundaries. What did you take in Waterloo again? Uh, health. And the only reason I took health at Waterloo is because it was the only health program in the country that didn't require math. No and I'm way. horrible. horrible. See, I was going to say a Waterloo program that doesn't require math. Well, I thought I you were like, weird. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going to give some like really deep answer. And I was like, oh, I was because it sounded like it was starting out like, oh, I was the easiest one to get into or something, which is the answer I probably would have given. Right. So it kind of kind of worked out that way. So much what it was. It was the only <laughs> yeah, one I yeah. could get into. So give us an, an update on True Local. Tell us like what just tell it for anyone listening who doesn't know what yeah. True Local is. Start there and tell us where it is now and where you are now. Yeah. So True Local, um, you know, we did all locally raised meat products and we we took a, a D to C business model. People could go online. They could browse all the different products that we had. And, you know, at our peak, we would have had over like 120 different products just in Ontario. And that's beef, chicken, pork, fish. Um, at the time, the only stuff that we had that wasn't from the province was the wild caught fish. So people could go um, browse from all these different products, put it into a box and have it shipped directly to their home. So if you know HelloFresh and all those companies, it was the same thing, but exclusively for proteins. During that time, we went through a bunch of different iterations and, you know, tried to grow the business and going to different verticals. And we eventually started getting into things like providing, um, you know, e-com solutions for producers and farmers and then got into doing the pick and pack side of it as well. And, you know, now, so fast forward five years, the company was acquired. So obviously that's kind of like the biggest, most exciting thing that, you know, we've had happen in our lives and in the, in the life of the business. And then I was on board for two years and now we're here in obviously 2023. I was on board for two years to help transition the company over to the new CEO. And my contract actually has just ended like, Three weeks ago, December 31st, 2022. And how old are you now? I'm 32. 32. You start this thing. How long has your true local journey been? We sold the company exactly five years to the day. Oh, that's when pretty it started. quick. Five years you sold. Now you're free. I'm yeah. not trying to say you weren't free. <laughs> maybe maybe it felt like free. Now <laughs> you're freer. Not, freer. Yeah. You're not under contract anymore. Yep. Um, how was that? When you sold it, was it kind of like, uh, I guess it was a euphoric feeling, but then afterwards reflecting back on selling True Local, was it a little bit, I don't know. A little, you know, did you have any remorse through that or no? In zero. Okay. Um, to be honest, you know, true local for me, I always, my goal, like my purpose for five years was to build a company and sell it before the age of 30. Like there was nothing else that I was working towards. There was nothing else that I had no other focus. Like that was my 100% giving everything I had towards that. So of course you get a lot of people. We sold for 16.7 in five years and uh, people are like, oh, you should have held on. You could have gone further. Mm. Well, first of all, if we look at the market now, you know, we sold at the perfect time. Um, um, and on the flip side of that, it's like, absolutely. And, you know, true local to me, just as a brand alone, like the idea of connecting consumers to suppliers and to, and to producers, there's a big brand there. Um, especially if you start getting into things like offering the e-com solutions, like offering the warehousing, like offering the last mile, but that wasn't what I signed on for. Like what I signed on for was I wanted to sell a company before the age of 30. Where does that drive come from? What's giving you that drive? So yeah, like it was, it's, okay. So this is like, this would be a long one. So I guess kind of like circling everything back. Um, I, I'm a huge believer in purpose and I'm a huge believer that people ask kids nowadays, okay, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I find that hilarious because how are you going to ask like a 20 year old, 
what they want to do for the rest of their life. Like people used to have midlife crisis at like 40. Now kids are like losing their minds at 22. Right. And there's a bunch of different factors as to why that's happening. But to me, it was always really obvious. Like there's so much pressure to figure out what you want to be doing for your entire life and then be working towards that. And to me, if you're lucky enough to know what you want to do with your entire life, like that's a gift. And the earlier that you discover that, the more blessed you are. Like if you look at a pro athlete, like look at LeBron, right? This is someone who at a very, very early age knew exactly what he was on this planet to do. And then he was able to cater his entire life. I'm a Jordan fan. So could we use the So Jordans, let's go ahead and get Now it's a great story. Oh, wow. Tell me more. Swap, swap. You can probably edit that out. Just throw Jordan in there. I'll just say Jordan a couple of times so you can use that. So, so Jordan, you know, this guy, absolute icon knows exactly what he wants to do in his whole life is catered towards that. So I, you know, I always say that the mo- the rest of us, like everybody else, eventually we'll figure out what our life's purpose is. But to put this pressure on you to figure out what you want to do for your whole life, that just screws you up and causes anxiety and all this. So I'm like, listen, if you're at whatever age, instead of trying to figure out what you want to do for your entire life, why don't you just figure out what you're willing to commit three years, four years, five years towards, and then really just give everything you have to that? Because I think that's where happiness comes from. Like, I don't think happiness comes from anything that people describe it to be, whether you're on the crazy materialistic side where you think money brings you happiness, sure, whatever. Or it's like, no, you get this intrinsic value of happiness. Like, no, to me, it's none of that. Like responsibility is happiness. Mm -hmm. So like finding something that you care deeply about, giving everything you have towards it, achieving that goal, despite how challenging that goal might've been to accomplish or all the things you had to go through, maybe there was a lot of things that didn't bring you happiness during that, but rising up to that challenge and rising up and impressing yourself. And that to me is what brings happiness. So for me, I've always described purpose as something that is so strong that you can't really actually describe it because it's a feeling. If it's something that you can conceptualize, like if you're like, Oh, I want to be a millionaire or, Oh, I want to sell a company or I want to be a professional athlete. If you can conceptualize it really easily, it's easy for it to come and go. A purpose has to be a feeling. Like if you can't have it or can't go after it, you're obsessing over it. So for me, that's kind of what's brought the best version of myself out is when I have this purpose. And I've only had two in my life. And the first time I ever had this purpose was when I wanted to play football. So in high school, I discovered football and it was like, it just became everything. Like it was what so position I played, oh, I moved around. So I played linebacker safety and then corner pretty much as the, um, as the, the leagues got more competitive, I would move to a smaller and smaller position. So started off linebacker moved, uh, when I was playing in, in uh, high school, then I moved over to safety. And then when I got to the university of Waterloo, I was playing corner. And it's funny because that was the first time there was ever anything that I wanted more than breathing honest to God. Like it was the thing that I was obsessed over. And in grade nine and 10, I was pretty much failing out all my classes. Like I was a horrible student, um, just a little asshole to be honest. Like nobody liked me. I didn't like anybody. And I was probably like one failed class away from dropping out. And I, I got to show you photos, but I was like this little fat, overweight kid. No with way. Afro. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Like I always, and even talking about it in the book, like my high school career is very different than where I'm at now. But of course, none of where I'm at now would have happened without my high school career. So all I did was, you know, skip school, tell off the teachers and then go home and play video games. That was my life. And like, I really enjoyed video games and the things that I, I was I liked, I was good at, but it was never like I had this purpose to go and like play video games. It was just things that I did. And eventually one day I was like, you know, I'm done with this shit. Like I really got to go do something that, you know, matters. And I found football and started dabbling into football and football ended up being this thing that I fell in love with. And as the weeks and the months would go by, I just fell more and more and more in love with it. And it wasn't until I realized that if I wanted to keep playing football, I needed to go to university because we don't have any really competitive, you know, college so you football had the purpose yet. then to actually get good marks. Yeah. And of course at the time I didn't even know. Right. But that's exactly what happened. I started realizing that, okay, oh shit, there's this huge barrier in front of me. If I want to go do this thing that I love so much, I have to change my life and I have to, well, a, I have to get fit and then B, I have to actually turn my grades around. So, so sorry, your grades are in this state. Are your parents supporting you here? Yeah. So, um, I was living with my mom okay. and my mom, the thing is like, I had a lot of just trouble with the schools in general. My mom always would have my back. Like she was the most supportive person on the planet, but my mom was also very like, listen, like you make your bed and you lay in it. 
Mm-hmm. Right. And the problem that I always had is that everybody thought I was dumb. Like that was the biggest thing. Like all of my teachers completely counted me out. Like this kid can't learn. He doesn't want to learn. Screw this kid. And that would be really, really frustrating to me because I'm like, I'm not stupid. I just don't give a shit about what you guys are trying to teach me. Like I don't care about. And, and, and you articulated that you don't give a shit. Yeah. In, in like a, yeah. In, in a typical kind of angsty, yeah. angry yeah, okay. high school yeah, way, yeah. which yeah. is, you know, that's exactly what, what was happening. So, um, and of course, I had never really done anything to prove to anybody that I could do these things. It was just more like, listen, I hate you and you hate me. You think I can't do these things. Therefore, I'm mad at you. So why would I try to show you these things that I can do? Right. And that kind of led into a lot of these different thoughts that I have. You're such a different person today. Holy shit. Oh, for sure. Like, it's crazy. I think I was, it's funny. I was just watching a video of like me in high school and it was like, oh my God, it was just, it was a whole different thing. But it's funny now, like on another topic, it leads me and I'm going to try to circle back to this so I don't go down too much of a tangent, but nowadays, especially when you're hiring or or recruiting people, um, if there is someone that is, you know, you you see that, that spark or that rawness and it's like, okay, you need to do these things well. Right. And they don't do them well. Most people count them out. Like you're dumb. You can't do it, whatever. But you kind of see something in them and it's like, well, okay, maybe you're not good in this, but go show me. What what are you good at? What do you love? Show me what you're good at. And then go be the best at that. And that to me is really, really interesting. Um, And I think that you can find like really interesting talent by just giving people the opportunity to express themselves in something they're actually good at or enjoy rather than being like, you got to fit in this cookie cutter mold. So with students, especially, and it was, that was the biggest thing with me. So when I found football, and things started turning around, that's exactly what it was. It was like, I still hated school. And it's not like I was the smart kid and I just flipped a switch and now it's like, oh, I'm smart. It's like, no, I had to like grind to do it, but I did it. And, you know, from going from failing out almost all my classes to graduating with like as an Ontario scholar with a 91. So when did you start playing football in grade 11 then? Yeah, it would have been the summer of grade 10. Summer of grade 10. So yeah. if you four at that time, what, three. Uh, three years, I did a victory years? lap. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Three years to then, then change things up to get to university. Exactly. And that it's funny because at the time, of course, I didn't know it. Now I know it looking back on it, but. I, I, that for that three years, I did all the things I hated the most. Like I hated studying. I hated doing homework. I hated dealing with all this type of stuff. And eventually the thing was though, is that I was so motivated to do those things and I was motivated to do them because I knew that they were contributing towards my purpose. Now, once again, at the time you don't know it, you're just like a, you're kind of dragging your knuckles through it. But looking back, it's so beautiful because all of the things that you really want in life, if you have this purpose, at least my opinion, is that you have a purpose that is strong enough and it's really this deep purpose. All of the things you have to do to get there, they don't end up being as bad. You have motivation to do them because you're working towards this purpose. Is it a purpose or just a goal? I think like, goals are part of purpose. purpose I think goals are kind of like the milestones and the things that you can accomplish on your way to reaching your purpose. I th- I, and you know, now we're kind of just breaking down the English. Sure, no, no, I was right? just curious yeah. how you were looking at but it. But at yeah. 32 years old, you're having that much self-awareness at this age that you can reflect back and say that you were lucky enough twice in your life to already have two purposes that pulled you. Because I said, I imagine the second one would be buying and sell, starting this business like you stated. Yeah. So you had football and then you had this business which became true local and you are that self-aware that you can observe that you're lucky enough to have this purpose pull you twice already. That's yeah. rare at 32, man. Yeah. We got to think I've probably lived two lifetimes, right? Like you build a business and yeah, sell yeah, it, sure. you know, like, yeah, like, <laughs> you know, I still have a long way to go and you know, I'm excited to see where I'm at at 40, but you know, I've any, you know, I had a job like out of university where I was managing 30 people and you know, just the things that you go through and then you try to build a business and you're in the trenches and you're getting punched in the face every day and no one's going to save you. Right. Like you definitely grow up quick. And um, so what made you, what was the conscious decision to start the business? It was, I'm going to start and sell a business by the time I'm 30. That was the, that was the purpose that drove you kind of going to do this. And it really didn't matter which business it was going to be. Yeah, kind of. So once I made it into university, so like I did, I did the thing, right? Well, okay. I didn't have aspirations to go to the show. Like I wasn't trying to go to the CFL. I didn't have the talent for that. And I just realized that early on, like my purpose was to play university ball. So once I accomplished that and I was like this machine, you know, methodically working towards that, I was like the best version of myself chasing this purpose and chasing this goal. Once I got it, you know, it was good played, but when that was done, it was like, uh Oh, like I don't, I don't have anything driving me anymore. Mm-hmm. And what ends up happening, I find is that when you don't have something that you're working towards or something that you're marching towards, you're pretty much just kind of spinning in circles. And that's when chaos comes and gets you. Like when you're not working towards something or progressing, that's when shit starts blowing up in your life. And I think that I think, and I, I don't know if there's a way to actually, you know, tangibly uh, quantify this, but if you're not marching towards a goal or becoming better day by day or whatever, week by week, quarter by quarter, month by whatever you want to call it, 
yeah, like there are just things that are like waiting to catch up to you. Like life just finds a way of. You're having these thoughts in your 20s or you're now telling us you knew you're, you're having these thoughts reflecting back. I'm reflecting okay. back on it. What yeah. books were, sorry, and I, I, I want to continue on this train of thought, but what books are you reading in your 20s? None. Okay. <laughs> Zero. Mm-hmm. The first book I ever read, I would have been 25. It would have been uh, when I, uh, probably a year into True Local and it was uh, Delivering Happiness by Tony Shea. Hmm. And uh, that was the first business book I had ever read in my life. Don't forget, I went to school for health. Like I knew nothing about business. We were at his Zappos head, Tony Shea, like Zappos. Went to his apartment at that we time. We went to his apartment and he had that treadmill debt. So we were in this like mass, where were we in? We that got invited to this Yannick. One. Oh yeah, Yannick yeah, Silver. Yeah. We actually went, got a tour with him of his offices in Las Vegas. Yep. You know, he's passed away. I know, unfortunately, right? yeah. And um, yeah, that guy was such a unique guy. I can't believe he was. I can't believe you're bringing guy. up that book. Yeah, That's yeah. blowing yeah. my mind right now. I always say, because that was the first, I didn't like, when I thought about business books, I was like, you know, stuffy guy in a suit reading a, <laughs> yeah. you know, lame business book. And I'm like, that was the first book that I read where I was like, wow, this is great. Yeah. I'm like, well, I'm not only am I learning things, this is, you know, this is entertaining. So it's interesting what you said about, because uh, I, well, I was listening to your story about high school and then how you're saying, if you don't have a purpose, you kind of just, you know, you, so you reflected on your own life. Right? Well, no, because it was interesting because I, I was, yeah, it was the opposite. <laughs> right. Like my, my journey through high school was like, I fell off the rails in the, in the, I was good. I was on the rails in the front half and then I fell off the rails in the back half. And I feel like you had I, a similar attitude to what Mark's described. Well, probably afterwards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was funny. I was playing football through high school, loved it. And that, but I just kind of just started wanting to hang out with friends more and stuff yeah. like that. So, and school was very easy for, if I showed up in class, it was very easy. I never really had to do much. I was on the honor roll and stuff. And then I was like, oh, so I kept doing less and less. Right. And then I, and then I realized the hard way if you don't show up in class, it's really hard to learn the material because <laughs> you're just not doing anything. So I'll just show up for tests and be like, I don't know any of this stuff, right? It was like, it's like I'm like, do I just write my name on it and hand it in? What, what do I do here? You've got that like talent paradox where it's so easy that you don't have to put the work in. I don't know if it was, then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I, I guess I don't know if it was easy for me. I just, maybe I just worked hard earlier and yeah. I learned some of the basics. Like I was in, I was able to kind of sneak by, yeah. you know, and then when I had to really kind of buckle down, it just, I didn't, I didn't have it because I was, I, there was nothing I was striving for that that time yep. I was just like I was getting up and you know I just kind of wanted to hang with my friends hey where are my friends oh I could go to class or I have some buddies that have left class and they're going to have a breakfast you know around the corner of this restaurant yep. I mean that sounds like a way better way option better, yeah. you know so I'd go hang out there so yeah it was just uh it was just backwards because I had no focus and my focus didn't come um it was it was probably when I was in school early, it wasn't so much focus, but it was when I reevaluated myself at that time. So I guess by this time, how old are you going to graduate? At that time, I was 19, 19 right? Then, so it was 19. Yeah. So I was probably at this time, probably 20, was, uh, maybe 19 or 20 was my first year of when I was in college. And I had to reevaluate kind of where I was in my life, you know, save the circumstances. And I looked at myself and I'm like, man, this isn't you. Like, you're better than this. And that's when, like, for me, my shift happened. Uh, it went back. Do you know what right. I mean? Because I was yeah. just like, oh, yeah. so I kind of went like up and then down and then yeah. I had to bring myself back up, you know, so similar, similar kind of journey. It's, so, it's interesting. To so me. then after the football stuff, then what was the self-talk like to start the business? Like yeah. that, that was just something you decided with a buddy or you just decided yourself? Like, what, how does that transition happen? Yeah, or so a couple uh, on that. But, but one thing that what you were saying, the one thing I always got to say is that I got to highlight because a lot of it had to do with my friends and my friends were like the smart kids. So when I was like a little asshole in grade nine and 10, I literally just had nobody to hang out with. And then when I came back in the summer of grade 10 and going into grade 11, like I was a completely different person. And luckily, like my best friends to this day brought me into that group. Um, and they were like the smart kids. And one of the things that I I remember also realizing was that, okay, I need to go to university to play football, but also there is no chance I'm going to be able to keep a relationship with any of my friends if I don't get past high school because they're going to all go off and do this thing. So what happened then actually, believe it or not, and I, I do give a huge shout out to my school and Cornwall and everything is that when I started getting my shit together, people supported it. So it's almost kind of like there was this part where people were like, okay, maybe if this kid gets his shit together, there's something there because like there are so many teachers, like probably three or four teachers to this day that I still am close with that oh, wow. helped me in that grade 11, 12, and then the victory lap that really kind of like helped push it forward. That's so, cool. so, you know, there's a lot of things looking back, but to your point, um, you know, what drove me now for this idea of business, honestly, it was money. Like we never had money growing up. So to me, I've always been financially motivated to this day. Like I'm still, I always tell people, I'm like, I think one of the biggest motivators for me is financial success. Mm-hmm. And I think nowadays, you know, it's 2023 and everyone's so woke 
joke and it's like, oh, you need more in life. And I'm like, look, fine, whatever works for you. Okay. Like mm. me chasing a check works well for me and it's been working well so far. <laughs> yeah. So you know what, what? There's a guy I know that, that like that and it's, it's about the money too, but sometimes that he's like, look, it's not just about the money for me. I use it as a scorecard. Yeah, totally. And that's me. Like, so if you're a competitive person, so if you're playing that level of, you know, even in university, you're a competitive person, right? And entrepreneur and stuff, type A personality driven. Sometimes you just need some, a barometer to be like, Hey, here's where I am with stuff or here's the success. It's like looking at the top right of the, the video game and seeing your score go up. And if that's, you're choosing money to do that, it doesn't have, it doesn't mean, have to mean you're a super materialistic person. And that's all you care about. At least in my opinion, that's, that's the way I look. I don't know if that's I, you I or just, not. I yeah. just wonder if that scorecard has lasting satisfaction. Like I think your purpose eventually evolves to something beyond that type of scorecard. Otherwise I feel the satisfaction is um, shallow. Uh, I'm, yeah, not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure why, but I, I could see in your 30s, but 40s now, I, I'm turning 50 this month and I could see how the purpose must evolve. Otherwise, it, there's no depth to it. You know, well, so it I think still, it's ever, very, it's, it's just, it's a singular focus. Yeah. And like it, it's, yeah, it, yeah, it, like it does so become no just a number. Yeah. You know, it loses that. I think once you kind of scrape and crawl, like, cause we don't come from money either. And our parents were immigrants and there was kind of some rough times, especially in the nineties. I was about to say crazy real estate market, but we're in a pretty crazy real estate market right now. <laughs> crazy real estate market in the nineties. Um, yeah, you initially need the scorecard for sure. So I'm agreeing with you. I just wonder if yeah. that's like, has a lot. I think power. just sometimes I think it's just very like, Oh, you're just, you know, you're, you're, yeah, your money you're financially driven. Oh, okay. That's like that. Yeah. Then all of a sudden you're just like, you're viewed as a certain type of person. I'm like, ah, it doesn't have that's, to be like that. That's, you know? that's exactly it. And I was going to say, there's a couple of things. So even now, like when I think about what I want to do after true local, it's like, okay, there's a component that's this financial component to it. But a, a lot of the things I put in is like, okay, I need to have a longer time horizon. So I want to build something bigger. Right. So for me, it's like, okay, when you look at Canadian founders, a lot of first time Canadian founders, They've got that five year time horizon because a lot of them are motivated by an exit and you can only build something so big and that has a certain level of impact in five years. What you can do in 10 years, though, that's mm -hmm. like exponentially greater. So that kind of gets me excited. And then the next thing I was going to say, like, I'm 32. Like, I, I, I know very clearly and to the same point where I'm like, I kind of live my life purpose to purpose to purpose. I don't necessarily have this huge giant view for what is my life's purpose. I like, I get very excited about fixating on something and working towards it. So I'm like, okay, I did the thing from 25 to 30. Now, you know, from 30 to 40, you know, what do I want to do? Where do I want to go? And for me, it's, it's still the thing that gets me going. And whether it's the fact that I've just, I love the lifestyle. You know what I mean? Mm. It's not a materialistic thing, but sure. it is the freedom. Like it's Monday. I'm great to come mm. hang out with you guys yeah. on Monday. No one's, you know what I mean? Like yes. you do whatever. If I got to yeah. go meet an investor or hop on a flight, okay, don't even think twice about it. You want to go move around like that to me, when you can live that life, you are a better person because you can think more long term. Like when, you know, I always say Kanye said the one line that he said, well, and he's like, you know, having money isn't everything, but not having it is. And I've definitely coming from literally like, the absolute gutter and coming now and being cool. like, I can kind of pretty much do whatever I want. You become a better person when you have the ability to do that stuff. So I think, you know, um, when I was in university and I did, did the football thing, I was just starting to like circle into chaos again. Gra grades are just, you know, nothing, nothing sure. as crazy as in high school, but it was just like, you didn't have I the wasn't, focus. yeah, I didn't have the focus. I wasn't who I could be, you know, and not that I even knew that at the time, but just, you know, it's just the way it was. So I'll never forget. I think I've told the story probably both times I was here, but it was when we heard that Snapchat turned down $3 billion. Oh yeah. I forget. I forget what you said. Pretty yeah. much long story short. We had no aspirations of anything. If we could like put 20 bucks together to go to the bar, <laughs> we were living our best life. But then we found out that Facebook offered Snapchat $3 billion and that like actually blew our minds. Like I, I, I remember the moment very clearly that <laughs> my mind exploded and I was like, wait, 3 billion, like beat with a B like, in, in, you know, 2012, you know, yeah. I remember thinking like if someone had a million dollars, they were the king of the world, right? Like I didn't even know that billion was a term that was being used. And I remember hate, I didn't like Snapchat at the time. And I was like, this stupid toy is worth $3 yeah. billion. And that's when I was like, okay, I'm, I'm pretty done with my health degree. Like I'm going to start going into this business entrepreneur world. So did that failed. So we did the instant messaging app lasted about a year, crashed and burned, picked up another one, went and did dash task, which was this uh, sharing economy platform. Uh, didn't crash and burn, but like soft landing failure. Um, and then eventually true local was, you know, kind of third one was the term and I was doing door to door meat sales. I remember time, I'll like, never forget. Time. Yeah, I know. I, it's, uh, it's such a trippy thing, but I always say there are like three jobs, um, that any kid should have. You should absolutely have a, a warehouse job. 
You should absolutely, as a kid at some point in time, work for a summer in a warehouse. You should absolutely do uh, a sales job. So like something where you're doing face to face. Exactly. Yeah. Things like that. So, so it helped a lot. Um, but yeah, so true local was the charm and, and that one's the one that grew. And of course, if we didn't fail at tell and fail at dash task, true local probably would have failed as well. So it's kind of like just this compounding thing. And then somewhere in between there, it just became this thing where I was like, okay, I can't raise money. Nobody believes in me. And, and as it should be, like I, I had no experience I was this random kid. I was just joking the other day. I'm like, I would go into people to try to raise money for like this app that made no sense with like a one pager being like, give me money. <laughs> I build company. Like it might as well have just been something like that. Right. So, but I remember definitely sitting there being like, okay, I'm going to go prove all these people wrong. You don't believe in me. Watch me go do it. And that was part of why I wanted to sell a company before mm-hmm. the age of 30. It was because I wanted to go prove all these people wrong. The financial success that came in with, with it is awesome. And the journey was going to be, you know, a good time as well. You know, that's what I thought. Um, and that's kind of where it all started. And that's then, what I thought. Yeah. yeah that's what I thought. A few more hiccups along the yeah. way than I, yeah. that I had Hiring to deal with people. and I anticipated. Yeah. Babysitting. Hiring. Why do you say warehouse job? Though? That Because you had a warehouse job? Oh yeah. Like yeah. when I was in, so like I said, we didn't have a lot of money growing up in Cornwall. So every time that I had to, so any, any summer in, uh, in Cornwall, I'd be working, whether I worked, I worked for the city. So like low income housing for the city, mowing lawns. Um, I always used to laugh because that was when like stand up comedy was really in. So like I would be listening to like Dane cook. This was like what, 2009 and just like on the stupid riding mower, just like pissing myself laugh. <laughs> and I remember like all the people, like, so it was welfare housing and they'd be like looking out their windows, like what the hell is this guy on? Like, he's just tripping out right <laughs> now. laughing. Hardcore <laughs> drugs. Yeah, because I, I think the same thing is my, my three are either like la- landscaping or draw or like construction because because yeah. we, we were on the we construction, construction. So like scraping scraping yeah. floors after the tapers done and it was like then all the dust and I'm like this sucks yeah and it was hot or putting the insulation in with the mask I definitely was, breathed in a lot of asbestos throughout those years it was oh, that yeah. type of stuff and then uh, you know I had past life in doing some stuff in a flea market it was part of a business and it was partly online and partly in flea markets around Toronto and um the, the what I learned in face to face sales at the flea market especially different flea markets different cultures different things I, I was like it was mind-blowing to me and it was it was crazy the learning curve was so steep but it was like it was so valuable looking back um that yeah i, I agree with you wholeheartedly there but it's, it's hard because I, I i i'm just wondering how i'm going to get my kids onto a construction site it's trying it's to almost, figure that out <laughs> it's like it was the same thing so on the warehouse yeah it was the same thing like i, I and to me so because we had none i i didn't care what i was i would have done construction in a heartbeat i would have been so happy but like in cornwall there's so many kids looking to get jobs and for me it was actually just hard to get a job like and you would think it's easy now you know the world's changed quite a bit but back then getting like a full-time summer job i was balling and i was like so appreciative i hated it like it was we were doing uh it was a uh, the warehouse i was on a line and i would take a board and put it in a box and do that all day. That's tough. That's, yeah, that's it. Tough. Just that's like tough. my yeah. brain just melting away. But yeah. it was like, okay, great. Like I'm, you know, I can go buy video games now. This is awesome. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, for sure. It was, it was, you know, I was, yeah, I was, I was appreciative of. So that. you get the call for someone's interested in buying True Local. Okay, right. So fast forward. Yeah. Um, yes and no. So uh, it's always crazy how these things happen. So pretty much my goal had always been that eventually we want to build it and we want to have it acquired. So it's kind of like, when do you start looking? Like, was there a right time? And I always tell people, if anybody's listening, any founders and they're thinking about having their company acquired, just get an M&A firm, you gotta, or an investment banker. I was the one who was like, I'm never going to need that. I was always that guy. Like, I don't need it. I'll, I'll figure it out on my own. And now I'm much more humble. And I'm like, please, anybody who can help, you know, teach me your ways. But in the early days, I was like, I already know who's going to buy us. It's one of these like eight companies. I've already <laughs> scoped it out. I, I know who they are. I'm going to yeah. reach out to them. And I had all those things figured out. And I was like all excited when that list would grow to like maybe 15 people that could potentially acquire us. Um, that's not really how this works. Like that could work potentially, but really when you run a process and you bring on these, you know, M&A advisors or so they shopped bankers, you around in a professional manner, they knew who was buying. Yeah. So the thing that really opened my eyes was when they came back with a list of 400 potential acquirers oh, wow. and I was like, Oh my God, I didn't even know about private equity at the time. I didn't realize that private equity was like a, a, a prime target for something like this. Right. So I was only looking at our competitors. I was looking at, you know, some of the industry portfolio companies. Um, you know, I was looking at some of the strategics, but it like, there's a massive, massive list. So that's the one thing. So we actually ran the process for about a year. We were working with them and you know, the company was growing. We did what, like I'm, you know, 1 million, 4 million, 
eight million and then when the company sold we were at 20 we awesome. did 20 million awesome. um and you know it was just around that time it was it was coming up to the five year mark that wasn't the thing for me like if i had to go to like you know six seven years to make it happen it was fine it was just like the 30 year old was kind of like the the meter stick and ironically the company sold i always say i'm like i got to do better next time because the company sold three weeks after my birthday so i was 31 in three weeks but we'll you know we'll let yeah, that one you slide. get a pass you get yeah, a pass we'll get a pass and, there, and so. reflecting back on this experience anything would you have changed anything with true local Local that you can talk about um you know i don't know if it would be like a marketing approach mm-hmm. an operations people purpose is there anything that you're like ah, oh, damn i really should change that or no you're happy with everything the way it was yeah i think that there's always someone that can come in and look at things that we could do differently for myself personally i would never change a damn thing at all in my entire life i think i got really lucky when i look at it where i'm so happy i always say like if you're happy or content with where you're currently at, like literally in this moment in time, then you would never have a wish to change anything in your life because everything that happened in your life, the good and the bad has led to that point. So when I look at true local, you know, we sold for 16.7 million bucks. I'm like, could we have done things differently? Maybe. Yeah. According to some other people, but like at the same time, I'm like, this is a dream. Like this is more than I thought we were ever going to sell for. So there's not, I would never roll the dice again, put it that way. I would never like go back and be like, Hmm, if I did this one thing different, because if I did that one thing different, who knows, maybe we wouldn't have gotten the outcome. It's almost like winning a super bowl and saying, would you go back to try to win it better? Yeah. And it's like, that I, I don't know. That's kind of the way I've always looked at it. But yes, so like looking at it from the like actual business perspective, there's probably a million things. Okay, what did you do really well? Build community. And how did you do that? We, we internal or with customers both? Uh, both. I okay, think. I, talk- so I guess on both. So okay, let's talk about internally because I think internally is what led to us having a really good customer community. So, you know, the one thing I'm most proud of, honestly, and this I didn't even realize it at the time. It was someone that was interviewing with us, but. When we started the company, it was me and a buddy, and then it was our friend, so my now wife. So, you know, we, me and my girlfriend at the time were dating for five, four years, and then she came on as our first employee. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from there- We're still together, so still together, it worked yeah, out. 10 wow. years. We just got married, actually, this Congrats. past year. Yeah, oh, so cool. thank you, thank you. Um, so we, uh, our first 10 employees were friends. So like literally no job ads, no nothing, like took our friends from all these other little jobs that they were working, come and do this with us. and those people were all still with us when we sold the company. And I think that's a huge testament to what we did in terms of like team culture and how we did it. And we were always the outcasts and the underdogs always. So it kind of forced us really to kind of have this outward chip on our shoulder. And I think that with true local, it, it's not like one of those things where it's like a giant company saying we care about our people mm. and culture. And it's like, you know that they don't, you know, it's like, you know, you yeah. can, if you walk down, you don't even know who these employees are. And on the flip side, we didn't end up being one of those companies that just preaches culture and then, you know, grows to a million bucks and just stays there and nothing ever happens. Like we actually said that and like wore it on our chest. And then we actually won. Like we actually did build a $20 million company focusing on the internal culture. So for us, I always say that like, I don't think people came to the company because of the company. People came to the company because they wanted to work for one another. And it sounds cheesy and cliche, but it was just one of those things where you would come in and you would see how hard and how deeply people cared about the company and it made you want to do that. So I think that there's a couple of reasons that happened. First of all, having 10 friends Mm -hmm. as the foundation really helps because then as someone comes in, it's like, you got to assimilate into that culture. And because we never raised any venture capital, it's not like we went down this like 30 person hiring spree in one go. And now you have this huge influx of new personalities. And now like things could start getting diluted. We'd be hiring maybe like a few people a month, a couple people a month. How many employees when it was sold? Can you show uh, about 60? Now? Yeah. Yeah. So at our peak, we were about 60. Cool. So, and then, and yeah. Then was there operational things that you did every week or every month to kind of just keep everybody together? Um, I know it was like thread through the daily conversation, obviously, yeah. but was there structured things or not so much? Yeah, I was big. I was really big into personal development. Um, and it's because I have no skills or background. Like I'm very much a generalist. I'm a jack of all trades. I kind of, I like to think of myself as a professional problem solver and the people that we hired, those first 10 people, they were kind of the same way. Like it's not like they were marketing experts or sales experts or operations experts. They were just, they really gave a shit and they tried really hard and they became really, really good at their jobs because of that. So how so, did you do personal development? Podcast and books. So we did a book club every month. Um, so every single month it was optional, but like show up. Um, yeah, is one of those. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would always just, you know, we would pick these business books. And oh, so you were reading now. Oh yeah. And oh, oh, now oh, avid. Well, yeah, po- yeah. I can, you know, I cheat a little on po- podcast. Pod- nah, big that counts. That but counts. Avid man. Like I'm, yeah. I'll go through like at least two a month okay. easily. And, um, that's because once again, like I just changed so much from this kid who like books are stupid. It's yeah. just that to now I'm like everything I need to just absorb as much as I can, you know? So for me, 
that was one of the ways we did a book club, which sounds really lame, but actually it, it stemmed from this idea of companies distilling these like these core values. And you, of course you go to like Facebook or any of these fang companies, or these big ones, it's like, there's this like integrity, you know, like, uh, yeah, like wholesomeness, yeah. whatever it is, it's all bullshit. So I was like, oh shit. Okay. How can we like, how can we do that at true local, but make it so it's not bullshit. Mm-hmm. And it was because we were growing, we were starting to grow and people were coming in and being like, Hey, like what's the culture all about? And I was like, oh, it'd be good to have something to say. So what I was saying, I'm a huge believer that, and there's actually a great book on it um, by Ben Horowitz. I think it's um, what you do. It's culture is what you do or something like that. Okay. Anyway, long story short, the idea is that you can't really describe your culture. Your culture is the things that you're doing. And so at True Local, I knew that we had a great culture, but we didn't know how to describe it. And I wanted to make sure that we didn't describe a culture and then try to live up to that culture. What I wanted to do was I wanted to have words that described our existing culture. So the book club, the idea was that every month we're going to read a book and then it's a business book or a biography or whatever it might be. And at the end of our book club, like the, the, we get together, grab some beers and talk about it. We would distill like one sentence or a word or like the key learning that we got out of it. So at the end of the year, we would have 12 of these like, sort of key takeaways and learnings and methodologies. And, you know, one of the ones, um, uh, as an example is, you know, I think, um, they have the, the book, the, uh, what was it called? Powerful, I think. And it's the Netflix story. Okay. Um, Patty McCord, I think is like their head of culture or whatever. And it really talks about like how you need to be like radical candor. Like you gotta be really honest with people. So we distilled out of that, the idea of like feedback being a gift. Like it's very important that you give real honest feedback, but it's also important that, you know, don't get your panties in a bunch. If you receive feedback, it's a gift. So that's like an example of a distillation that we took from a book. So after 12 months, we'd have all these really interesting things. And what we would say is at the end of the year, let's look at the things that we feel fit us the best and boom, there you go. That's our, Hmm. that's our thing. So it wasn't us looking to live up to these things. It was as we go through an entire year, which are the ones that identify us the best? And it worked really, really well. So that's like one example. We do podcasts weekly, force the team to listen oh, cool. to a podcast every week, you know, stuff like that. Uh, in the operations side, I don't know how much you can share, but was there a key metric that you were looking at it? Was it new customer acquisition, oh. volume of sales going out? But was there a couple that were really near and dear to the heart? Something that you were like, oh no, this number I really need to look at? Yeah, like our gross margin really changed my world. Um, once again, I started started True Local. We didn't know anything other than get sales, money in yeah, bank, yeah, yeah. <laughs> buy product. That was all we knew, right? And we really, one thing I, I didn't know it at the time, and I don't even know if it was the right way of doing things. It just inherently made sense where it's like, let's grow to a certain size and then optimize. Mm-hmm. And I don't, that would not work again today. Um, but it wasn't this whole kind of growth at all costs. Why wouldn't it work again today? Well, nowadays, like you can't raise cash without profitability. Mm-hmm. Like you need to be, you got to have a self-sustaining business. But if you were market. starting yourself, you could do that strategy. Well, if you, if you can fund it yourself, mm-hmm. like if you, if you can survive it, if, I, just, I just mean, if you can, yeah, if you can fund it yourself, tap into your own I prefer it that way, to be honest. Like, I like going big. You know, I enjoy it, and I, I understand that it takes investment to go big. Like, if your first, well, what would you rather, and I'll try to use numbers that make sense, but, like, would you want to go have your first month of profitability be month three, and you're one thousand dollars profitable or do you want your first month profitability to be month 13 but you're a hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars profitable in that first month right and that was kind of always the way i looked at it where i'm like i can focus now take down some of the growth to reallocate um resources and time and effort and focus more on on optimizing our margins and optimizing our systems and our process it'll slow down growth but we'll be more efficient and we'll be more profitable um I was just like, no, I want to get to, like, I want to get to at least like eight to 10 million before I really start to dial in and see what works. Because most of these things that can help your business operationally typically don't work at scale. Like they make a lot more sense at scale and understanding the difference between like 1% gross margin is really different when you're doing $10 million versus when you're doing a hundred thousand dollars. So the, you know, gross margin, when that hit me, like I, I remember I did, we didn't even do our first forecast, like real hardcore, like you know, like bank worthy forecast, probably until like year two and a half, you know, and we actually really took all the doesn't seem that long at all. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it was yeah, long well, for you, but no, that seems really good. <laughs> well, I guess when you look at it, it's halfway through the sure, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, in that regard, yes, yeah. So, sure. halfway through, we did our first where it wasn't just like 
you know, like like four, five, like ten rows, and they're all just growing at ten percent per month, and just everything is growing at ten percent per month. It was actually like, okay, no, like what do we think we're going to grow in this month, and how does you know all these different you know cells and formulas, how do they actually interact together? Um, so that was a big one. Um, our conversion rate, right, on the website was a huge one. We spent a whole year going down that conversion rate rabbit so hole. Were you studying marketing intensely at this period? I consider myself a marketer, mm. uh, not to today's standards. I think now kids are just blowing my mind sure. with what they were. But when I went into True Local. I considered myself to be like, my skill is the marketing. Um, I remember we ended up having this absolute rock star uh, chief marketing officer, uh, Courtney Jang. She's out in Vancouver. One of the best marketers I've ever worked with. So fortunate that she was our CMO for, I guess, four years it would have been. Um, but it's funny because she started off doing email marketing for us as a freelancer. Um, and uh, I remember we're always talking, we got along really well. And I always said, I'm like, I would hate to be a marketer working underneath me because I'm the marketer. So whatever you do, I think there's a better way to do it. And I always say, it's like, it sucks to be uh, on the engineering team if your CEO is technical mm -hmm. and it probably sucks to be on the accounting team if your CEO is like a financial background, you know? So I was the marketer and um, she just always would take it like in stride, was always beating expectations, just really, really good. And we started talking a bit about, hey, why don't you, know, you know, look to come on sort of full time sort of thing. So she ended up being the one that ran with the marketing all the way through pretty much up until up until the acquisition. Doesn't it, and I'm trying to think back, like I'm trying to think of all the companies I know, the, the CEO or founder really, the found one of the founders of the company pretty much always has to be at the beginning the best sales and marketing person because mm -hmm. if they're not that that thing's never getting off the ground because no. i'm trying to think of any example that it wasn't i'm sure there are like the odd one but i'm just trying to think like mm -hmm. any entrepreneurs that i know or businesses or ones that have got big it's always even if they were technical they were even, even the sales and marketing side mm -hmm. they yeah. had to be kind of because if you don't if, you, if you're not passionate and you can't sell what, whatever your business is, you can't even bring people on board. Exactly. Right. You have to be, isn't that like, yeah, I can't most, think I'm, of it. I, I can't, I'm sure there are exceptions. I just can't even think of any. I, yeah. I would have to say the same thing. Like I'll tell you, I'm watching cause I'm investing now. Right. And I'm seeing founders and it's like, when you don't have a CEO or a founder that really can like sell. take charge, just sell, but it's not even just that. It's like, it is, it's the transfer of enthusiasm. Mm. And if you are a CEO who can't do that, you could have the best product in the world and you, you're just not going to go anywhere um, to the point. Once again, like, how are you going to do it if you can't recruit? So, OK, let's say you're a CEO and you're, you have this very narrow, uh, you're a generalist, but then you have a very one very specific, you know, good skill. And that arguably should be pitching the company. If you can't pull in talent to then fill up the other areas that you're not good at, like you're screwed and you're going to be trying to do all of it. So I deal with it now on a regular basis, like founder egos is really interesting. So that's like on the other extreme. But then, yeah, like to your point, I've talking to VCs now kind of casually and a lot of them will tell me stories about these amazing products, these amazing businesses. And they're just like the founder, you know, the CEO, the founder, we got to find either a CEO to put in there or something, which I also think doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't imagine a world where, Oh geez. Yeah. Like, unless you're like, unless you're raising like $50 million and you have a massive, massive team and the founders already been in it for a while, if they're still in that like grinding phase, there's no way you're going to airdrop some CEO in to take the founder's Agreed. role. It's never going to happen. Agreed. And you said founder ego. So those are guys that, or girls, those are people that yep. just like, um, that know everything. They're better. They know everything better than anyone else. Is that, and our, that, and our products the best? Like, don't you get it? Well, is oh, that, is it? Yeah. Is, well, I think I, on, on your point. So I think like refuse to accept that there's a better way than their way. And I, it, I, to me, um, I think that I've, I've always been like, you know, I definitely have that a type personality and I definitely have an ego, but I think that once you don't again, come across like an a type personality at all. Yeah, I'm joking. I'm totally <laughs> joking. You can tell you are a driven dude. Yeah, it's it's crazy, and I think like the whole thing of like I've just lived two lifetimes. I just realized that like there are parts that you have to you have to suppress some parts of that. Like you've got to learn how to to live, and it's not going to be about you when you're in the business. So actually, guys, let let's reframe all that. So when I was doing sales, I was the guy. Right. I was the sales rep. So like I'm number one. I'm the guy like I'm the alpha dog. I want to be number one. I want all the resources and I want all the glory. And um, arguably everyone is my peer. But, you know, friendly competitiveness. I learned within year one, like going into true local that is not in any way, shape or form yeah. how yeah, that different. can work. Like you absolutely take a back seat to all of the other A players that you want to build up and support. So I think when I see, you know, found to me, I've, I think it was very quick when 
it's like, if your idea is better than mine and you're willing to argue it, like that's the one thing I'm going to argue or I love to argue. So I'm like, I'll back down really, really quick on any idea. Honest to God. Like, and, and that's the one thing I think if you were to kind of ask like the leadership style is that like, I'll go head to head, but as soon as it clicks, sometimes you're just like, Oh shit. You're like, yeah, damn, you're, you're right. You're right. Okay, cool. Back it off. That's something that I look for a lot in founders where it's like, Hey, listen, like objectively you're wrong or objectively this is off. And it's usually, a, I, I love observing teams. Like I'll, I'll kind of just sit and like audit a meeting and it's like, I'm seeing, I'm like, Hey, this founder's wrong. Like there's only one move here. It's back, back, backtrack it. And they just kind of keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Cause this ego is just like, they don't want to admit that they're wrong or maybe, you know, is this is a lot. It's, and it's, it's more common than you would think. Oh yeah. And that was surprising to me because of course we, we do true local and, we just kind of did things our own way and we assume everyone else is doing it either our way or better. That's just like what you think when you're in it, right? You're like, okay, everyone's doing at least the way that we're doing it or they're better. You don't think there's other companies that like haven't had that same level or, or are, are pushing it at that in that way. So that was something that was a bit of an eye opener um, after post acquisition, which is like how amazing of a team we had and how lucky it was. And that's kind of what led to the community aspect of the thing that we did well at True Local was building customer community. Do you think True Local wrote a bit of a trend just also on the timing of people looking for better food sources kind of picked up steam over the evolution of True Local? Like that five year window, I think a lot of people, 10 years ago, people started talking about grass grass fed beef, for example, but it was kind of really fringe five years ago, six years ago, it started becoming a bit more mainstream. Now it's more mainstream. So true local. I mean, it's something we always try to observe is what big trends are happening without us mm -hmm. that we can ride. Yep. And I feel like true local did get some benefit, maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally, who knows, or I guess you would, you'd be able to answer that. But I feel like true local probably benefited from that trend. And if you agree with that, so I'm curious if you do agree. And then is that something you're going to be watching going forward for your next allocation of whatever you spend your precious time on a trend to ride? Yeah. So I always say this, right? Like luck is 51% of everything. And I say 51% and there's arguments. Maybe it's people will be like, Oh, it's like 10% luck or 20% luck. I'm like, listen, it's, it's 51% because you could be the best person in the world, the most talented individual in the best market with the best funding and the best resource. And a tornado can come and just take away your, your warehouse. So at the end of the day, luck will always beat out, you know, so anyway, so, um, for us, yeah, of course, you know, we, we had super fortunate timing and I think it was kind of like this combination of, I'd been literally peddling meat door to door for four years yeah, prior. So, so I, it, yeah. I saw it yeah. and I saw where it was going and I saw how it was evolving too. And I also saw Mark had an information advantage on the market. <laughs> I did. Well, you know, you talk about market research and talk to your customers. Yeah. I literally for no, four years spoke. would sit in someone's house and convince them of this product. It was like the best market research ever, but I also just felt like we got really lucky spotting how it was morphing and evolving. Like I remember very clearly knowing that it was like, okay, there is a transition from the descriptors of the meat mm -hmm. to focusing more towards the local and how it's being raised. And that was a very interesting time where it was like, everything was about organic or this, you know, this little phase of this natural heading, which is just like a way around saying organic and is this whole sketchy thing. So there was all these descriptors that were going out in meat. And that was like, let's say like timing wise, it probably would have been maybe like 2013 to 2015 was very description based. And then from 2015, uh, maybe like 2016, 2017 on, it became, well, where's it coming from? And is it local? And that was a big focus. And we just true local, the name just worked out perfectly. And the way we were moving the business, it was, it just, it was a lot of luck. Cool. And I think that that luck we just did a good job of taking our information and saying, okay, listen, like there's this perfect kind of, um, scenario unfolding here. Let's, you know, go ride that wave in terms of what I'm looking at moving forward. Of course, like I always think that the best thing you can do is just try to, you know, you can be a, a 10 out of 10 founder and I'm, I'm not suggesting that's the case, but you can be a 10 out of 10 founder. And if you go into a difficult business, mm -hmm. it's just like, you're going uphill, you're going upstream. Yeah. It's kind of like, why don't you try to be a 10 out of 10 founder and then ride the wave that's coming. The only thing that I find fascinating now though, is that like things are moving so, so fast. Quick. So it's like, <laughs> even if you spot something that you're like, Oh great, this is where things are going. It happens next week. And then in three months it's gone. And you're like, Oh shit. Now you're on to the next thing. And the thing that you were excited about now is like, 
<laughs> you know, oh, we don't well, we were looking at that. some of the automation, the robotics numbers, and over the last couple of weeks, like oh, yeah. AI and but and so AI is, is separate from even these robotic numbers, and the growth in just in in so many sectors and just that. You know, I'm looking at that. I'm like, wow, how do like what's to still come? There's been so much growth there. What's to still come? How do I ride that wave? Like, you know, what, and, and there's the barrier to entry is huge in that world. But I'm like, how do I get on that wave? You know, or now AI. I mean, that's and just, it's evolving. It, and that's just start, starting. And it's going to go so, so fast. fast. Like, for example, we don't do a lot of clipping of our podcast. I mean, we've been heavy audio on this podcast. Mm-hmm. And for probably two, three years, we're like, oh my gosh, we should do more video clipping. And we started when my son was here last summer, we started doing a little bit of it, got away from it. And we're like, okay, we're going to commit to this. We're t- we produce a lot of content. We'll clip it out, put it on some of these platforms that we kind of have been neglecting that we know could be uh, sources of lead generation for this particular business. And we're, we're looking at different ways to do it. And we were almost hiring a person Then I don't know if we're still hiring someone to help us out. But then we found this AI that based on the tone of your voice or the inflection in your voice, we just tested it out last week. Yeah. Did Keith show you some of the clips? Yeah, yeah I saw them. Yeah. It, it will clip this podcast that we're doing right now yep. based on the tone of our voice. Yep. We'll take different segments and it'll put all the text under it does based on the topic so like when the yeah, topic changes so it actually listens about the topic changes and then it'll give you the clip and it'll tell you what the topic is and you can choose the ones you want and we're like hold what? on it does this and how long and yeah. yeah and it's how much labor is that replacing for someone to have to sit down and edit all this kind of stuff so it's evolving that fast whereas yep. two weeks ago we were looking at a human doing it then we were going to outsource it now we're looking at ai ai to just maybe auto publish some of this stuff for it. so There's, to your point it's just going so fast have you read jeff booth's book yet the no. price of tomorrow no I canadian entrepreneur from out west started a multi hundred million dollar company found got into a little bit of problem with some of the founders went through some real challenges with that business really really intelligent guy wrote a book called The Price of Tomorrow that basically says our financial system is based on inflation, but technology is forcing prices down at such a rapid mm-hmm. rate. We have a massive moment where we have an inflationary force that must happen for the monetary system to continue to exist, yep. but technology forcing deflation. Right. And it's like this shit, this battle of two plates and one of them yep. is going to win. He thinks it's like te- technology. And at the end, he talks about Bitcoin a little bit and that right. kind of stuff. It's a quick read. I think I have a copy I'm just here. Laughing well, I'm using your fist. Yeah, yeah, I'm smashing your fist. fist. Are very powerful, and I'm showing. We're gonna clip power. this out. This yeah. is really clip. like your <laughs> fist. Yeah. yeah, I'm showing the you battle. The sound. The you got to hear the yeah. fist. You know, you got to hear it. It's a well, quick read. I'm gonna get. I think I have a copy left here. I'm gonna give you this. You have. It, it'll take you maybe a day to read this book. It's that powerful. It's worth like, it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes you, you think. You, you got me on one of the favorite books I've ever read. I'd see it up there at the Bitcoin standard. Yeah. So listen, I, I take all book recommendations. Yeah, and, but, and to your <laughs> point, he says humans are just bad at extrapolation, and that when we see these technology trends, we can't anticipate the impact it's going to have. And he talks about this example that. His example's the best. Yeah, that if you take a piece of paper like this and you fold it 50 times, oh, how right. high will it go? Yeah. And on the last fold, not that you could, you know, it's like physically impossible for us to do it, but if you could mathematically just measure this out and fold it 50 times, the last fold goes to the moon or the sun. Yeah. I think it's like think to the, it's moon. the moon. Yeah. And that's the extent, that's like an extrapolation curve that we can't as humans really see. And with technology advancing as it is, it makes it challenging for you to make time. Like, where are you going to put your effort? Where are you going to put some of your monetary ability now? Now, it's interesting. So, yeah, the way I look at it is like, listen, I'm not a technologist and I'm a non-technical founder, so I don't code. I don't do any of that. And I start thinking about, okay, how is the world going to change? What do I want to get involved with? And I think that there are some, there's so much stuff that obviously you learn from building a business. But I think one of the things that I I really want to stick with is just kind of like, I don't necessarily know what's coming next, but I want to, I want to myself personally, and I want to put a team together that's really, really good at being quick at using the new technology yeah. and finding and tinkering and, and seeing how things are going to be playing out. Like, so if this new technology is coming out, I just want to work with people that are really, really good at seeing, yes, this works. No, it doesn't. Or this is how we can use it to make our business better. And I think that's just a, the, gets me more excited than a specific industry or space. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the people that put those teams together are going to lead the future because, <clears throat> you know, for example, the part of the reason we sent out chat GPT quickly to our team first, everybody thought they lost their jobs because they all made an account and we were like making Facebook ads and eat it made promotional emails for our, our oh, next yeah. event in amazing. We were getting it to write poems and jokes and the whole thing. So everybody immediately thought they were out of a job, but then we're like, no, 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 we just need to stay ahead of this curve yes. and stay, you know, stay adopting this stuff. So I think if you can put that together, that type of team, it's a huge competitive advantage. Yeah, well, that's then the you're thing. able to use the technology and yeah. most people won't, you'll be able to use it before everyone else. Exactly. Right? Well, it's, it's even that it's also just using it better. Like, let, you know, like the thing I always look at is that people are like, Oh, we're losing our jobs. 
just become really good at using the technology. Mm-hmm. Like it's going to become the new norm isn't, Hey, I expect you to come up with like, w- you know, two, uh, blog posts a week yeah. for our newsletter. Okay. And it's not that we're like, Oh, let's, you know, screw you. And now we're going to go ahead and use chat GPT. It's going to be, no, no, no. We just expect you to be really good at using chat GPT. Exactly. So we can have a really, really good blog every single day rather than it being twice a week. And I think the people that just embrace that are the ones that are going to find success. So right now it's similar. Like I, I, I I'm probably so annoying to my friends, but like, I literally just fire them off like every day. I'm just like chat GPT, new tool, like check this out. You know how you can play with it. Check out Jasper AI, check out character.ai, like all these different things. And I went deep down the web three rabbit hole, right? Like we could, we I forgot you it. said that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, deep. Like I was in there. Like I do talks now on it. Like I love it. I'm still so in like, it's to me, it's the future. The thing that I think that sucks a lot is that people do not know how to talk about web three in my opinion at least without making it seem like the sensational thing like web three isn't actually a thing that's the one thing i realized after two years in web three web three tools are a thing and what they do is they make web two companies better and you get this whole web three thing it's like web three versus web two and you get all these extremists in web three that are like web two is the devil and web three is the future and everybody that's building in that space is trying so hard to be web three it's like how do we use nfts how do we have tokens Mm -hmm. how do we turn this into a DAO? it's like okay stop doing that go back and come up with a web two business model because web two business models do make sense. Like, you know, we live in this age of, you know, we know how to create a product. We know how to extract value. We know how to provide value. We know how to generate revenue. And instead of trying to be like, how do I create these things in web three, start thinking about how those things could not necessarily, but could make your company better. And that was the biggest thing that uh, that was one of the big things that I took out of being in in the whole kind of web three space. And I've been messing around with stuff since like 2017, but like it was like two years of deep tinkering, playing in the space like participating in DAOs and doing all that. And then the other thing that I learned um, was how to take community building to the next level because what Web3 did really well is they did an amazing job of rallying people behind a cause and um, crowdsourcing talent, crowdsourcing problem solving, crowdsourcing uh, project management. Like they did a really good job of that. So the thing that I look at that I get excited about with the my two years sort of really going deep on on Web3 was not that like anything came out of it of like a product or anything, but it was like new ways of learning. It's kind of like when you go off and learn a new mar- martial art, like you're an MMA fighter and you go off to, I don't know, like Brazil and you learn and study with like this master. And it's like, are you now a Brazilian jujitsu specialist? No, but you now see that there are some things that could be used to, you know, make you yeah, as you a more better fighter in MMA. Box. So the thing with AI is that I'm cautious because once again, first of all, it's going to be moving stupid quick. Like it is so, so, yeah. so fast. And to your point, I was, I'm going to send you, there's a list of probably like 30 AI tools. Everyone's going crazy over chat GPT right now. Right. But there's like 30 AI tools that are pretty much imagine just chat GPT, but hyper specialized yeah. for a specific thing. And one of them is of course like podcast podcast clipping, which blows my mind. Like uh, how it does that is crazy, but there's another one called character.ai. And so people are always going off like, Oh, chat GPT stupid. It doesn't have any creativity. It doesn't have this. Like this thing just went and rewrote you like 18 essays and you're out here criticizing it. It <laughs> always drives me crazy, but they say AI won't have personalities. Well, character.ai is this natural language model where pretty much people can go and create like Elon Musk or like Bowser or like Socrates and you go and have a chat and they are responding as that individual. That's crazy. And they are spot on. It's good. It's all personality. I think I've seen someone do this and they use Rogan as an example. For sure. Yeah. 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 And have you seen the graphics one where you type in like, you know, give me a car in a desert with a sunset or, you know, a palm tree and it'll produce these images. Like we're monkeying around with some of that stuff. It's just blowing your mind. Yeah. 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 So this this is, but this is, so to your point, this is now right and and it's moving faster and faster so like this stuff that's released now is based off like not the bare minimum but it's 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 this is just it's like in its a infancy beta. yeah barely the a speed at which it's going out oh. what do these tools look like let's not even say here. Let's, yeah let's say but just only two years let's say let's even give it two years two years what do they look like they're like limit, it, it's, this is, it's this gonna is where be, it gets scary nuts. Like, what happens when ai some ai in some jurisdiction can start a corporation because the jurisdiction allows online corporate no but yeah. listen so the ai start no but it watch becomes problematic the AI becomes, starts a corporation, yeah. then ai can earn money Uh-oh. and through bitcoin or whatever else you want i'm just using bitcoin because that's my favorite but it earns money through bitcoin this ai then controls some bitcoin that it can then use to deploy and buy a multi-unit residential building in Cornwall, for example. Then it can rent out to humans 
and it can hire those Boston Dynamic robots. Oh no, <laughs> you know, those Boston scared, scared <laughs> to, come, to come get you to no, pay rent. So yeah. I'm, I'm like, I'm half joking. Yeah, as those are the rent collectors. Yeah. I'm like half <laughs> half joking. But how many steps are we away from AI in some jurisdiction? I, I believe in Seoul there is a a venture capitalist firm or a hedge fund that has. Um, AI as a seat on its board yeah, I remember that, that has ownership Scary. shares. So when this AI has ownership shares That's and has weird. money to deploy, mm -hmm. where are we where humans are in charge and then all of a sudden does it just like flip where we are responding to the AI, which, and I think that goes to Elon Musk's fear of like, people aren't realizing there's, there is a little bit of possible danger ahead in some of this <sighs> stuff. I know, you know what, so like, uh I don't know. The thing with Elon confuses me too, because the guys, I'm a big Elon fan. I know people are losing their mind over sure. him. I'm an Elon fan. You know, at the end of the day, like what this man has accomplished, it's just like it, incredible. Who, it's where yeah, you to throw rocks it. at this yeah. dude. You know what I mean? Um, but I remember like, I, I always felt like when I was following him, he was so against AI. Yet now he's like one of the number one guys pioneering AI. So is it kind of one of those things where yeah. it's like either, you know, die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become but a villain? From listening to some <laughs> interviews with him, yeah. Yeah. but from listening to some interviews, he just wants it controlled by human like he doesn't want it to allow that it just becomes completely to your point like it can open the corporation buy the real estate mm -hmm. and start renting it out because yeah. he just sees i think in his opinion he yeah, sees extrapolate that, that forward 10 years and he sees that we? path and he's like this is problematic so i think it's like well, we remember he was talking about what was the term he was using but it was, it was kind of like responsible mm -hmm. development of ai right mm -hmm. it was, he was using a different term but i think that was the idea behind it well the thing too is also for me that like as soon i'm convinced that like as soon as ai can learn on its own and i don't know what the technical like what's the technical term from that but like i don't know if it's that it can connect to the internet or it becomes you know conscience or whatever mm -hmm. but it's going to take two seconds to realize that humans are the problem mm -hmm. like at the end of the day it, to I me it would yeah, look I think it passes the turing test is i think that's when it's like actually acting as a human or something like that. is that yeah is that the so, thing yeah um, yeah, you're right. I, well, I would say like, okay, so if it's like now this thing where it's like, okay, I'm not beholden to this race and it's like at the end of the day, we all live on this planet, which arguably, once again, if this AI did become sentient, it would probably download information and so quickly that it would probably be able to do things that we would consider to be magic. Like if you think about it from a physics perspective, is this, if this thing is exponentially getting smarter as it takes in more information and now it's developing new technology, which allows it to be better it would be the idea of the folding of the paper where it, every day would go by and it would just become so much smarter. It could do things that we would almost perceive as being magic. Like you could yeah. manipulate atoms or whatever. I don't know. I'm going down a rabbit hole here. No, but, but as outlandish as that could see, sound now to some people, you would have to, realize and admit that it's the ch the probability oh, yeah. of that is not We're zero. Like it's non-zero. There, yeah, it's there, there's not, a, it's an actual can. probability of that. And then, then where does your mind go from there, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Um, so, Mark, yeah, yeah. the book, the book, True Founder. In the last few years, you wrote the book. What is the book about? Who are you trying to serve with the book? What did it What did it do for you? Can you talk about this a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, super exciting. Um, book comes out February 7th. It's called True Founder, What No One Else Has the Guts to Teach You About Starting Your First Business. Um, so, I ended up getting a book deal with Forbes like a month after the company sold. And the process has been wild. I never had this, you know, inclination to write a book. Um, and you know, they were very compelling and it's like, listen, this is an amazing opportunity. And I kind of started thinking about it and I'm like, okay, well, you know, let's start, you know, seeing what this could look like. I'm an avid note taker. So just a bunch of lessons that I've learned throughout true local or life or whatever, I kind of have them all written out. So I was just kind of going through it. And eventually when I first started writing, it was, it was a mess because I was considering the people that I look up to so the people that I want to be one day so like my mentors are potentially reading this I would consider uh, my peers reading this so other people that have exited that you know kind of get along with then I considered people that I think I could teach to one of the you know people that I want yeah. to inspire reading this and then it became of course as per usual became nothing to nobody um, and it wasn't until I really zeroed in to be like well what could I do that is gonna provide the most value and it's like listen if it, I don't there's no point in writing a book to try to sound smart to people that you know maybe I want to work with one day like if I want to make a book, let's make it for people that I feel like I can really, really help. And the people that I feel I like can really, really help are first time founders because I just went through that. Like I, I lived that, like that's the life I lived. So once the book became very specific to first time founders, it was so easy to put together. So it pretty much became a tactical guide mixed in with some of my 
personal stories and how similar the football story is obviously in there and kind of talking about how this is one of the early days that I figured out, you know, how purpose, you know, led me to my motivation. But I'm like, I don't want it to be super fluffy either, where it's just like, oh, read this random kid's story. Like I'm 32 now, you know, I haven't done like what we did with True Local is amazing, but I'm still writing my book totally that right. way. So I was like, okay, well, I wanted to be a tactical guide. So it's 16 chapters um, and it's everything from, you know, the number one skill that you need as a first time founder, which to me is being a professional problem solver, how you can do that, um, whether you should hire friends or whether you should hire for experience, what it's like to raise money, um, working with agencies, because a lot of founders struggle working with agencies, um, how to put your book club together to find your culture. Um, there's oh, cool. all of these different things, and the book is split up into um, into four different parts. And the first part talks about just like the mindset stuff, and I don't want to go into that too, too deep because it's like there are way better people out there to talk about mindset. But at the end of the day, getting started, like this idea of going into it blind, like I thought it was going to be fun and filled with rainbows and people are gonna be like, Oh my God, Mark, look, this founder life's so good. <laughs> yeah. Like that's not it at all. Right. And you hear all these yeah. things where it's like, this is how you need to do it. And this is how you got to think. And none of those were relevant. Yeah. So I just remember being like, there are a couple just really key things that if I just knew going into it, I probably would have saved myself a lot of headaches. So that's kind of the beginning of the book. And that is once again, stop trying to be a CEO or a CTO or anything like that. You're just a problem solver. Mm -hmm. And if you go into it with that mentality, you'll be better. The idea that, um, you know, business, people always say business is a marathon. I don't believe that at all. I think business is a series of sprints, not a marathon. So kind of talking about how, like when you're going into your business, there is going to be times when there's a major opportunity right in front of you and you got to sprint, 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 sprint towards that opportunity. But then once you get that, take a step back, optimize, figure out what you've broken along the way, fix it, and then kind of go on to the next one. So there's things like that. Um, and then the next part of the book gets into, okay, now you've decided to start your business. Here are some of the things you need to know. So how do you avoid co-founder drama? Okay. Well, you know, maybe get a shareholders agreement. Well, what's a shareholders agreement. So kind of tie, tying into some of that type of stuff. And then it finishes off with, okay, maybe you're at like, you know, you've got revenue, you've got a team. What is your job now? And really it kind of talks about how your job is to go, you know, now to go work for your team. And it's like, how do you transition as a founder, as the person who has to be the number one salesperson who has to be the one who's always pitching the business, um, to then, you know, you know, pushing the boulder up the hill, let's say, and then, you know, you get to a point where it's like, okay, and the way, actually, just to keep it simple, the way I paraphrase it in there is that pretty much you work in the business, everyone knows that. Everyone knows you work on the business, everyone knows that. But the thing is that I think there's another one where it's where you're working outside of the business. And that's where you know, you've know you got people that are working in the business, you've got people, which is kind of like your, you know people that are just whatever role you have, mm -hmm. they're working in the business. Then your managers are working on the business, so you don't have to do that anymore. That frees you up to go out, and now you're, you're shaking hands, kissing babies. You're meeting investors. You're doing the interviews. You're shouting the company from the rooftop, all these types of things. So it's from my perspective of what I really think the truth is like to try to build a $20 million company. And the whole overarching theme is that like at the end of the day, work-life balance is a joke. And I think that when it comes to having, God, I'm so happy you're putting that in the book. <laughs> oh my shit. So the, the whole thing is that, you know, if you're on your second or third profitable businesses, by all means, like work life balance is great. And you should have that, especially if you've gone through your lumps and things are but good. But when you're starting, when you're starting, man, stop trying to make people feel bad for sacrificing everything to chase after their dream. Like that to me, it drives me insane. Like you look at pro athletes, nobody is going to Michael Jordan yeah. when he was a kid being like, eh, you're really, you're at the, you know, you're at the courts too much. Yeah. You probably should, you know, go, maybe Slow we'll get a down. job. Yeah. Change to Jordan. They're not LeBron. Just no, smart. Really yeah. Tell us yeah. 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 Sales, sales guy, <laughs> smart guy. <laughs> so like even though, you know, stuff like that. So, and that to me is really where it all started was awesome. like, you know, just, if you're a first time founder, it's okay to give all yeah. of it up to chase after this thing. And that's, that's the book. That's cool. Written by someone who's actually done it all, which is amazing. And you know, what's interesting about hearing you speak is that if I take, you've written this book now, so, you know, at 32 years old, now you've had, you've sold the company, you did it, you've written the book to document it, which is incredible. Think about giving this book back to your like 20 mm -hmm. or 22 year old self, which is only like 10 years ago. Think about that. But you know, what's interesting listening to Mark, he doesn't have a self image problem. Like even in high, when you were describing in school where you said those teachers, you know, like you were kind of pissing them off, they were kind of pissing you off. And you said something early that it, where you said, I knew I could do this stuff just because they didn't know, like, wasn't my problem and it was pissing me off, which to me, that internal self-talk tells me that Mark never had a self-image problem about what he could accomplish. Like his confidence was always there in himself. And Did you? Always. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, that's the one thing I talk, and I don't know. I, I yeah, that like, would be my greatest book. I think if I could really, and when I'm older, I would love to because I get that all the time, and I don't know, and it's my greatest gift, and I'm blessed because of it. I think it probably had a lot to do with you know the way I was raised. Like my mom, like my mom was everything to me, right? And she gave up everything to raise me, and I think there was part. She of, told you make your you make your own, you sleep in your own bed. You, you kind of sleep yeah, in what but you she do. always believed in me. Always, so I, I think I never had. That and she was the only one, right? How did how do you know she believed in you? The words she shared, yeah, the words she shared, the and just like the way she would always have my back, even when I was wrong. You know, she would have my back because she knew that I could do these things as well. I never had to be said; mm-hmm. it just was there. And I, that's what I'm saying. I don't know. That's just like one. I always say, I'm like, listen, the way someone is today is such a confounding. There's so yeah. many things. It's a crock pot, and you take life experiences, yeah. you take interactions, you take your genetics, you take the environment, you mm-hmm. put it in there and stir it all up, and then you know you now that's who you are as a personality so it's like and those things change all the time you know what's the concentration of all these different things in this mm-hmm. crock pot so you've been lucky that you've crossed paths with these teachers who supported you once you made the change that group of friends that you stumbled into your mom thank god for your mom and then you know going through and you met the, the business partner you're you said you're currently married you just got married yep. right and and she was a first employee yep so mark's cross paths with people who've kind of supported him just like almost the right time and you create your own luck as well so you kind of brought that into your life but it's been interesting. There's been these people through your life too to kind of build you to where you are. You've taken full advantage of it. I'm not mm-hmm. saying they're responsible. You're ultimately responsible, but it's been interesting. Cool it, story, man. Yeah, thank you, no, and I appreciate that. Like I said, and still, still a lot to go. Um, I think the one At 32, thing- there better be. You got a lot <laughs> yeah. to go. And with health, where, dude, you're living to 160, man. You got to- <laughs> you know, black, black don't crack, you know, so. <laughs> Scottish skin does, man. The, Christ, the Scottish skin, I'm, t- I, I'm telling you, Scottish skin is the worst so far, I think. I always, uh, I always I say one thing so people the one thing people always ask and, and this I think is important because I, if this once again helps anybody else but people would always ask like what's the one thing you felt when the company sold and um, there was a big part of it for me where I was like I already knew that one day it was going to happen and I, I didn't know but I knew so when it did happen it wasn't this like crazy euphoric surprise yeah. it was more like you know about time like I, I knew I was just waiting for this moment to happen but the one thing was that I've always felt like, honest to God, if you put a gun to my head today and, and like look me in the eyes and said, like, if I wanted to go be an astronaut tomorrow, I would dead ass look at you and say, yes, I could. Do I want to? Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Do I think that that would take a lifetime of ultimate sacrifice and giving up everything that I know to be what normal life is to potentially chase this? Yeah. But like in 30 years, could I have just locked myself in a university and studied and done the fit and whatever? Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll bet on myself any day of the week on that. Um, so even with that level of confidence, which is a gift, there's still that part of you that there is always the thing where it's like, okay, we've done things so against the grain that like, what if it's wrong? Mm -hmm. We'll figure it out. But like, what if it's wrong? And that's the one thing. If I was like at 99% on the confidence level, I always wondered what it's like, what would it be like if I had that extra 1%? Like, damn, like I did this, put a team together, you know, absolutely crushed this industry here in Canada did these amazing things coming with holes in my shoes. What if I could do that extra 1%? And when true local sold, that's actually what I remember more than anything, where it was like the validation of awesome. You were right. And it's like, to your point, that's why I'm so adamant that I would never change anything because the ups, the downs, the left, the right, it's served to get to this point. So now it's just like, that's why I feel like I'm so just like, okay, at 40, I feel like it's a crime that gives me, I don't get anxiety that's what would give me anxiety is like this idea of being in the same place at 40 where I'm at now. Cause I really feel like I can accomplish great things. Like I really feel if I really get after it, I can accomplish these awesome things. So that was the one thing, like when the company sold, it would just gave me this, like this, like slow, soft, you know, comforting warmth of, okay, dope. You did it. Like you're proud of yourself. We're good. Awesome. Move on next. Yeah. Mark, next. we're, <laughs> we're through. I mean, to be able to kind of be bystanders and be a tiny little f- part of this journey, just by observing you and talking to you the times we, we are, I feel grateful, man. We talk about like your life, your terms, and you personify that, like you are living life on your terms and to have the freedom now to do as you please and be here on a Monday or travel. That to me is like, we talk about how fortunate that is for us that we travel as much as we do. And we have the freedom yep. that we have, like, it really is everything, you know, life just feels good when you have that. So congrats on everything so far. And the next, you know, 32, now the next 32 years, man, I, I'm, I can't wait to see, uh, 
what you're going to do. It's going to be amazing. And we're going to be cheering you the whole way, man. So cool, Mark. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate you did not have it. to come and give us an update, man. So I really, really appreciate it. I'm sure everyone listening is going to appreciate it as well. So the book, True Founder, yep. the website to go to would be which? So just marklafleur.com. Super simple. Mark with a C, lafleur.com. Right now we are having um, this awesome business grant. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we put together a business grant. So for any founders listening, um, we put it together. It's uh, over $50,000 worth of agency credits. So we have, you know, like Commerce Garage that manages Facebook ads, Google ads, and they'll do your content creative. They put together like a $25,000 credit to manage your ads for three months. We've got, um, you know, Tiedelman SEO that's doing three months worth of SEO services, right? We've got um, V and Co doing PR services. These are like top tier agencies that are doing three month credits towards helping you grow your business. And all you got to do, it's a pitch competition, two minute pitch, who you are, what your business is, how you would actually go ahead and use these credits and you just submit it online. On your website? On the website, yeah. So you go to the website. The business have to be at a certain point? Nope. Or think just anybody can apply. We're obviously gonna go ahead, we are gonna go and we're gonna watch it and give it to the to the business that we see it having the biggest impact on. Um, but Canada, US, everywhere except for Quebec, sorry, but you gotta change your laws. Yeah. But everywhere, <laughs> literally anywhere uh, and anybody at any stage of their company can apply. And I urge people to apply because this is something that, you know, when you're looking to figure out an agency and you're looking to figure out, you know, how do you want to find the right people? It's tough. tough. It's yeah. tough. So this is there for them. So that's how we're promoting. Very the cool. That's very cool. Mark. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. A pleasure chatting with you and getting this update. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Hey, thanks for tuning in. You can find every new episode of the Your Life, Your Term show on all the major streaming platforms. So Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together, like these right here, or some of the reports that we've put together, like these right here, you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it for now. Until next time, your life, your terms.